Thank you. Good morning. And it's an honor to be here in Grand Turk for the first time. As the gentleman said so eloquently, and I thank him for the introduction, my name is Dr. Umar Johnson, and I'm visiting you, young brothers, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. I grew up poor in poverty in Philadelphia. I come from the same neighborhood as Bill Cosby, Jill Scott, Meek Mill, Marvin Harrison. A lot of these celebrities all come from my neighborhood. But my mother and father were financially poor. We did not have much in terms of money. So I had to make a decision when I was very young, your age. I had to decide what I was going to do with the rest of my life. So many of my friends did not take school seriously. So many of my friends did not think much about the rest of their lives. Some of my friends are dead in the cemetery. Other of my friends are in prison serving time. Some of them will never get out of jail for the crimes that they commit. What made Dr. Umar different from the others? There was one thing that set me apart from my friends. There was one thing that guaranteed my success. And I want to impart that thing to you guys now because we are all largely men of color. We are Africans and as black men, the world has stereotypes about us. There's a stereotype that you don't want to do nothing but play sports. There's a stereotype that you're not interested in doing your schoolwork. There's a stereotype that all we want to do is have fun, chase women, smoke weed, eat and sleep. Those are the stereotypes. And you're going to have to break down those stereotypes if you're going to realize the dreams that you set forth for your life. What is that one thing that set me apart? What is the one thing that's gonna set you apart? That one thing is called discipline. Discipline is the ability to do what you don't want to do when it has to be done, whether you like it or not. You better develop it. Because if you, don't want the, if you do not develop it, you will not mount too much in life. It does not matter how intelligent you are. As a psychologist, I evaluate children all the time. Part of my job is to find out who's intelligent and who's not. Part of my job is to find out who needs extra help in school and who does not. And do you know what I find? The issue with young black boys, you all right here. It doesn't matter if you live in Brooklyn. It doesn't matter if you live in New York. It doesn't matter if you live in Jamaica, Haiti, Turks and Caicos. It doesn't matter if you live in Toronto, London, Ghana, Nigeria. Black boys around the world have an issue with self-control. We have an issue with discipline. And you will only go as far in life as the discipline you build into your personality. When I went to college, I went to college with a lot of my buddies from Philadelphia. We went to a college known as Millersville University, a small, predominantly white teacher's college in southern Pennsylvania. When we showed up to Millersville at 17 years old as freshmen, 17-year-old college freshman. I never forget it. One of the white men who ran the program for the freshmen stood up in a room full of black boys just like this. His name was Mr. Joe Sharetta, an Italian American. And you know what he said? In a room full of black boys from Philadelphia. He said, look to your left. Look at all the boys to your right. I'm willing to bet you your last dollar that when you 
graduate in four years and walk across that stage to get your degree. Most of the boys you see to your right and most of the boys you see to your left will not be graduating with you. And guess what? Four years later, on May the 17th, 1997, when I earned my first two college degrees, I have six now, but when I earned my first two college degrees, I looked to my left and I looked to my right and the prophecy that Mr. Sharetta gave us four years earlier that most of the black boys who started college with me would not be there to finish it. And guess what? He was right. What separated me from them? What's going to separate you from him? You from him. You from him. Your discipline. When I was in the library studying, my friends was out playing basketball. When I was in my dorm room doing my homework, my friends was out chasing girls. When I was studying for tomorrow's test, they was out smoking weed. When I was finishing my term paper, they was out at the frat house getting drunk. The only thing that separated me from them was discipline. I don't care how much talent you have. I don't care how much talent you have. I don't care how brilliant of a mind God may have blessed you with. If you do not have the discipline, dedication, persistence, and perseverance to develop your talent, you will be a waste of that talent. These are the facts, gentlemen. And I need you all to understand that life is not all about funny games. Some of y'all play too much. There's a time to play, and there's a time to be serious. And if you don't know the difference between the two, that makes you a fool. And too many of us play so much that one day we wake up and we're 20 years old. One day we wake up, we're 30 years old. One day we wake up, we're 40 years old, which is my age, and you realize you've played your whole life away. Get serious, fellas. Get serious. And there's another thing. Enjoy your childhood while you have it because you only get it for 18 years. Some of you want to grow up so fast. You can't wait to be an adult. You can't wait to be in charge of your life. You can't wait to tell your mother and father that I don't have to listen to you. Well, guess what? When you turn 18, you can take over my bills. When you turn 18, try raising my two daughters. When you turn 18, try paying my taxes. When you turn 18, try being responsible for everything involving your life. Enjoy your childhood. You only get 18 years of it. The rest of your life will be as an adult. It ain't no need to rush it. Because I'll tell you right here, right now, some of the best days of my life was when I was your age. I remember when I was 11 years old in fifth grade, Miss Robinson, my favorite teacher. I'll never forget that year. I remember when I was 13 years old in the seventh grade, West Philadelphia, Beaver Junior High School. Will Smith's mother was our school secretary. I miss those days at Beaver Junior High School. I miss my days in college. I don't want to go back. I love my life now. But I want you to enjoy your young years because there are few of those. Young men, young men, when you leave this world, when your body is put six feet under the ground, your name will be on a tombstone. And on that tombstone will be the day that you were born. And there will be the day that you left this earth. And between your birth date and your death date will be a dash. And that dash represents everything you did with your life from the day God gave it to you until the day God took it back. And I want to ask you, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Please don't think that luck is necessary to be a success. Luck is not necessary to be a success. Hard work is necessary to be a success. Some of you may want to be athletes. Some of you may want to be entertainers. You might want to be a swimmer, football player, basketball player. And guess what? I don't have a problem with that. But I do need you to know something. I need you to know that only 1%, only 1% 
Only 1% of high school athletes will ever make it to the pros. You have a greater chance of being struck by lightning than being drafted into the NBA. You have a greater chance of being struck by lightning than being drafted into the NFL. I got friends in the NBA and I got friends in the NFL. And guess what? Many of them were not even the best athletes in my neighborhood. They were not even the best athletes in my high school. But they made it because in order to become a success in the entertainment industry, you do need a little bit of luck. You got to be at the right place and at the right time in order to get discovered. But guess what? If you want to be a professional, you don't need no luck. You want to be a doctor, you go to college for four years. And then you go to med school for four years. And then you do your residency for two to four years. You're a doctor. No luck is necessary. You want to be a school principal? You go to college for four years and go to grad school for another two years. You're a principal. No luck. You want to be a lawyer? You go to undergrad for four years. Go to law school for three years. Seven years after high school. You are a lawyer. No luck is necessary. You don't need no luck to make it in this world, but you need guts. You need hard work. You need a work ethic. If I look at your report card grades, if I look at your school test scores, how many of you are doing well in school right now? Raise your hand if you all straight marks A's in school. Very few of you. What the rest of you doing? Getting ready for prison? What is the rest of you doing with your life? Because guess what, young men? Guess what? You don't wake up one day. You don't wake up one day and all of a sudden decide that you're going to be a person of character and discipline. You have to start deciding that right now. You don't wake up one day and all of a sudden become a success. You got to start right now. If you lazy at 10 years old, you'll be lazy at 30. If you lazy at 12 years old, you'll be lazy at 22. If you lazy at 15, you'll be lazy at 35. You do not change unless you decide to change yourselves. Gentlemen, every last one of you have to answer the million dollar question. Everyone in this room today has to answer the million dollar question. What is Dr. Umar's million dollar question? The million dollar question is real simple. I want my young brothers to hear me well. I want my teenagers to hear me very well. Because you're about to walk out into that world known as life, and you better be prepared for it. The million dollar question is whether or not you're going to graduate high school from Grand Turk and choose not to pursue another day of education. If you graduate from high school and do not go to college or do not go to trade school, you will trap yourself into making minimum wage for the rest of your life. What is minimum wage? $6.50 an hour. You take $6.50 an hour and you multiply that by 40, 40 hours in a week. Let's round it off to seven. $7 an hour, 40 hours a week is 200 and eighty dollars. You multiply that by four weeks and you have your take-home pay for the entire month. Who in here can survive on less than twelve hundred dollars a month? How are you going to pay your rent? How are you going to pay your car note? How are you going to raise your children? How are you going to pay for your cell phone? How are you going to get your hair cut? How are you going to buy clothing? How are you going to pay your gas bill, electric bill, water bill, life insurance? How are you going to do that? On less than $1,200 a month. You can. And now you know why we got so many black men in jail. Now you know why we got so many black men breaking the law, not just in Grand Turk, but all around the world. Because when they sat in your seat, when they were your age, Nobody told them that preparing for the rest of your life begins today, not tomorrow. Do you want to be a minimum wage poor man? Or do you want to be a successful black man? And the only way you're going to get there is through college and trade school. Now some of you might not want to go to college. 
And that's okay. I went to college because I wanted to be a psychologist. You have to go to college to be a psychologist. But if you don't necessarily want to be an expert in a field that requires a college education, I need y'all to start talking to them young boys over here because they, they, they paying attention to y'all and not to me, fellas. Okay? Guess what? You can go to trade school. You can be an electrician. You can be a plumber. You can be a carpenter. You can be an auto mechanic. You can be a barber. You can be a computer networker. You can be a brick mason. You can be a woodworker. There's over 30 different legitimate trades that you can master by going to trade school. So if college ain't yours, that's all right. But you must go to trade school. Because I'm a psychologist who works in an office, but guess what? Somebody had to build that office. An electrician had to put electricity in my office. A plumber had to come in and install the water system. A carpenter had to come in and design that building. So if you don't want to necessarily use your head, learn how to use your hand. Because guess what? A man who can use his hands can always feed his family. A man who can use his hands never has to worry about going to bed hungry. A man who can use his hands never has to worry about keeping a roof over his baby's heads. Every one of you will be fathers one day. Every one of you will be husbands one day. And I want you to be able to look your wife in the eye and say, baby, if you don't want to work, you don't have to work. Because I have my own business. If you don't want to work, you don't have to work. I make enough to take care of us. If you don't want to work for somebody else, you don't have to work for somebody else. You can come and work for me because we own our own business. And that's another thing. I don't want you spending your whole life working for someone else. Black people got to get over this getting a job syndrome. I'm sick and tired of the getting a job syndrome. Yes, you will have to work for a little while. I had to work for people too. But I work for myself now. You work so you can one day be economically independent. I do not want you working for someone else the rest of your life. You want to be a teacher? Start your own school. You want to be a doctor? Open your own hospital. You want to be a lawyer? Build your own firm. You want to be an engineer? Start your own practice. You want to be in business? Open your own business situation. Because when you own the business, you decide how much you get paid. When you own the business, you can hire your brothers, you can hire your sisters, you can hire your cousins, you can take better care of your mother. Be a businessman. Do you realize the top 1% richest people in this world don't go to work? The top 1% wealthiest people on the planet Earth do not wake up and go to work. They are business owners. They stay in bed while your parents wake up and go work for them. It's called unearned income, gentlemen. 20 years from now, I want you to be living off of unearned income. You're going to have a corporation in the business where you hire hundreds of people. If you don't want to wake up, you don't have to wake up because you're the owner. Never settle for being an employee. Never settle for being an employee. I remember when I resigned from the school district of Philadelphia. I was the youngest black psychologist in the whole school district. The fifth largest school district in America. My friends thought I was crazy. They said, why are you quitting? You know how much money we make? I said, it doesn't matter how much money we make. I want to be my own boss. And guess what? I never regretted the decision. Now I make my own schedule. I go where I want to go. I pay myself what I want to pay myself, and I want you to be in the same situation. But let me be clear, fellas. I'm not talking about making a lot of money so you can drive a Mercedes. I'm not talking about making a lot of money so you can spend $200 on a pair of Air Jordans. I'm not talking about making a lot of money so you can wear expensive clothes. I'm talking about making a lot of money so you can come back to Grand Turk and build a school, build a hospital, build a business, put people to work, improve the community. I'm talking about making money for the greater good of the community. Guess what?
up, fellas. Do you know how long you're going to be working after you graduate from high school? Do you know how long you're going to be working after you graduate from high school? You're going to be working about 60 long years. Most of you, most of you will be retiring around the age of 60 and 70. So you graduate high school at 17, 18, you're going to be working until you're 60, 65, 70 years old. That's a long time to be doing something you don't want to do. And that's why you have to decide whether you want a job or whether you want a career. Do you want a job or do you want a career? Do you want a job or do you want a career? What's the difference between a job and a career? A job is somewhere you go in the morning and you punch in a time clock and you are expected to do the same thing all day, every day. Nobody cares about what you think. Nobody cares about how you feel. You are simply paid for being there and going through the motions. That's a job. With a job, if you call out, you don't get paid. With a job, you get sick, you might not get your whole paycheck. That's a job. You get paid for your time at a certain place. Or do you want a career? Focus. A career is something you do where you get paid not for how long you was at the job. You get paid for what you do at the job. So for example, I'm a psychologist. I conduct psychological evaluations. When someone calls up Dr. Johnson and say, too much movement over here, I need y'all to sit still right here. You're acting like y'all got that ADHD, sit still. I'm talking to you too. Or maybe he gets up in here, handle it. Okay? When someone calls up Dr. Umar and say, I want you to do a psychological evaluation, there's a certain price I charge. If you don't want to pay what I charge, go find another psychologist. But I have a career. When you have a career, you determine how much money you are worth. When you have a job, you pay whatever they want you to pay. If I don't go to work, does my pay get docked? Of course not. Because I'm not paid for how much time I spend on the job. I'm paid for what I do when I'm at the job. Do you want a job? Or do you want a career? Jobs are boring. Jobs are tedious. Careers are fun. Careers are interesting. With a career, you are expected to use your power, your mind power, your intelligence, your expertise, and your training to impact what you do. With a job, nobody care what you think. Just keep on doing until 4 o'clock come, check out, go home, feed your kids, go to sleep, wake up tomorrow, and do the same old boring thing again. You're going to be working for 60 years. Which one you going to do? Gentlemen, this is real life. And you better get serious about it. Life can be fun if you plan it right. Life can be hell if you think everything is fun and games. A time to play and a time to get serious. Listen, if this brother right here goes to high school and he doesn't do anything after high school, he gonna be stuck making $6.50 an hour. He gonna struggle. This brother went to high school, but he went to college. By the time they retire around the age of 70, he would have made a million dollars more, a million dollars more, a million dollars more than the brother who just settled for a high school diploma. This brother went to high school, got his high school diploma, he got his four-year college degree, he went back to college to get his two-year master's degree. By the time these three retire, around the age of 65, 70, he would have made three to five million dollars more than the person who graduated from high school. This young brother graduated from high school, went to undergrad, got his master's, decided to go back and get his doctorate. By the time they all retired, he would have made 10 million plus more dollars. 10 million plus more dollars than the brother who settled for high school. What am I saying? I'm saying that I don't care if you don't like school. I'm so sick and tired of you young brothers talking about what you don't feel like. 
I'm sick and tired of you young brothers talking about what you don't want to do. I'm sick and tired of you young brothers making excuses for being lazy and shiftless. You better remember something. Remember this, if you remember nothing else Dr. Umar said here today, if you do not learn to do the things you don't want to do, if you do not learn to do the things you don't feel like doing, you will never be in a position to do the things you want to do. Work comes before play. Play doesn't come before work. As I prepare to wrap up, as I prepare to wrap up, this is International Men's Day. The word man is a root word for the word manifest. As a man, you are expected to manifest for your mother, your father, your brothers and sisters, your wife, your children, your community, your friends, your country. What are you going to manifest for Turks and Kings? Are you going to manifest the school system? Are you going to manifest the hospital? Are you going to manifest the business to put people to work? What are you going to manifest? Because unless you bring forth something that benefits the brothers and sisters of this island, then you are a waste of time. These are the facts, gentlemen. I need all of you to start spending more time reading. Your problem is you don't read enough. When's the last time you picked up a book and read something that your teachers did not require you to read? You have to read. In my briefcase right now, I got two books. My hotel room, I got about eight books. I don't go nowhere without books. When I came from South Africa two weeks ago, I had a whole suitcase full of books. They looked at me like I was crazy at the airport because I had to pay extra money just to fly my books. That's how important information is to me. When you read, gentlemen, four things happen. When you read, four things automatically happen. Number one, number one, you. Stop talking. Number one, when you read, your brain automatically picks up new words. You don't even have to study the words. When you read a book, you learn new words without even knowing you read the word. And one day you're engaged in a conversation and you're using words you didn't even know you knew. The greatest machine ever invented is the human mind. If you just put it to the book, it will take care of the rest. You have to learn that vocab because you're going to need it to pass those tests to get into college. You need that vocab because you're going to need it to pass the assessments you take right here on the islands. You have to improve your working vocabulary. And what do we know about young black boys? Whether you in Turks, whether you in Haiti, whether you in Grenada, whether you in London, Holland, Amsterdam, New York, or Los Angeles, your working vocabulary is about three years beneath your age. If you 16, you talk like you 13. If you 13, you talk like you 10. If you 10, you talk like you seven. And one of the best ways to improve your articulation of the English language is to start reading more material. Number two, when you read, your mind picks up new facts and information. Your mind picks up new facts and information. You learn about the world you live in. You have to be knowledgeable about the world you live in in order to change it. Number three, when you read, you improve your ability to communicate with the written word. Because reading is a conversation with the author, and you learn the way the author communicates through the written word. And the last benefit of reading is when you read, you improve your ability to communicate with the spoken word. I will tell you right now, one of the reasons my elocution is so well is because since I was your age, I did nothing but run around with books. You better learn how to start running around with books. Put down that cell phone. It's a waste of time. Put down that tablet. It's a waste of time. Stop surfing the internet. It's a waste of time. Turn off the TV. It's a waste of time. If your parents were here, if your parents were here, if your mother and father were here right now, do you know what I would tell them? If your mother and father were here right now, you know what Dr. Umar would tell them? 
I would beg them, I would ask them, I would plead with them for Christmas. When you go out to buy Christmas gifts for your son this Christmas, do not buy anything that will take his time, his attention, and his energy away from academic improvement. Most of the gifts that your parents buy you for Christmas and buy you for your birthday don't do nothing but work against your academic improvement. How many hours you spend playing that video game? How many hours you spend watching TV? How many hours you spend on that cell phone and then look at how many hours you spend reading? If it was up to me, you would have no cell phone. If it was up to me, there would be no television in your home. Develop this, gentlemen. Develop this in closing. In closing, I want you to study the lives of great black men. I want you to start reading the biographies and autobiographies of great black men. I want you to read about the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey from Jamaica, who built the largest Pan-Africanist organization in the world, who gave us the red, black, and green flag. I want you to study Dr. George Washington Carver, born in slavery, who gave us over 300 products from the peanut over 500 products from the sweet potato, over 200 products from the soybean. I want you to study Dr. Lewis Latter, the black scientist who wrote the textbook that taught America, China, Europe, and Canada how you can light up a whole city at night with incandescent light. Did you know it was a black man who taught the world to how to put electricity throughout an entire city I want you to study Dr. Charles Drew, the black man who came up with the technology for how you can give somebody a blood transfusion. Study Imhotep, the world's first mathematician, medical doctor, and philosopher who built the Great Step Pyramid at Saqqara. Study Kwame Nkrumah. Study Jomo Kenyatta. Study the Nambia Zikawe. Study Thomas Sankara. Study Patrice Lumumba, study Steve Biko, study Robert Sabukwe, study Sekou Toure, Kwame Toure, who are these men? Malcolm X, who are these men? These are what we call Pan-Africanists. I am a Pan-Africanist. I want you to be a Pan-Africanist. A Pan-Africanist is someone who believes that all African people are one people. Whether we live in Turks, whether we live in Nigeria, whether we live in Europe, whether we live in New York City or Philadelphia, we are all children of Africa. I will leave you with a quote from my ancestor Frederick Douglass. The first of my family to be stolen from Africa and brought to America during slavery was a black man named Bell. He was stolen, most likely, from Nigeria. He was put in a slave ship and shipped for three months over to Talbot County, Eastern Shore, Maryland. He married a black woman by the name of Selah, for whom my five-year-old daughter is named. They had Grandma Jenny in 1745. In 1774, two years before America declared independence from Britain, Grandma Jenny gave birth to Grandma Betsy. My Grandma Betsy was born a slave. But she married a free black man, Grandpa Isaac. They had 12 children. One daughter was named Harriet, another daughter was named Betsy. These two sisters were raped by the white man who owned my family, an Irishman named Aaron Anthony. As a result of that rape in 1818, Aunt Harriet gave birth to the greatest black leader in American history. His name was Frederick Bell. At the age of 20, Uncle Fred ran away from slavery and changed his name from Fred Bell to Fred Douglas. The next year, in 1819, my five times great grandmother, young Betsy, was raped by the same white man, giving birth to Frederick's half brother and first cousin, my four times great grandfather, Stephen Henry Bell. Grandpa Stephen wasn't so lucky. He never got a chance to run away from slavery. He married a black woman, Grandma Caroline. She was a slave on the same plantation. Their firstborn son was George Washington Bell, my three times great grandfather who went on to become the first black public school teacher in Talbot County, Maryland, after the Civil War. After the Civil War ended, Grandpa George married Grandma Annie. Grandma Annie and Grandpa George gave birth to Grandma Caroline. She moved to Philadelphia. She gave birth to Grandma Vivian. 
Grandma Vivian married a Spanish-speaking Afro-Cuban from Havana, and they gave birth to my Grandma Ida. She met James Johnson, and they gave birth to my father, Jamal. And he met Barbara, and on August the 21st, Umar Johnson was born the 11th generation descendant of the first of my family to be brought to America. I'm saying that to say that no matter how long you've been in Turks and Caicos, you are African. And don't you ever forget where we come from. Too often we spend too much time. Too often we spend too much time. Too often we spend too much time. Focus. Don't focus on where the slave ship brought your ancestors to. Focus on where the slave ship picked us up from. Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess the faith of freedom and deprecate agitation are like men who want crops without blowing up the ground. They want rain, but they don't want to deal with the thunder or the lightning. You want the ocean water, but you're scared of the waves. Frederick Douglass said, a man may not get everything he pays for, but you must pay for everything that you get. Frederick Douglass said, for 20 years, I prayed to God for freedom from slavery. For 20 years, I prayed to God for freedom from slavery, but the good Lord gave Frederick no freedom until I got up off my knees. Until I got up off my knees. Frederick Douglass said, if you want respect, stop looking for pity. The man who pities you will never respect you, and the man who respects you has no need for pity. But most of all, young brothers, as I leave you, he said, remember this, that power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. I wish all of you luck. Whatever you become or don't become of yourself, blame nobody but yourself. Not mommy, not daddy, not the government, not the islands, not poverty, not the white man. Look in the mirror because God gave you two arms like everybody else. God gave you two eyes like everybody else. He gave you two legs and a brain. You had the exact same thing everyone else had when they came into this world. So make no mistakes for what you don't become. Make no mistakes for the shortcomings that you make of your own life. This is your life, and you decide how far you go in it. Marcus Garvey said, Marcus Messiah Garvey, the father of Pan-African nationalism said, without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life. Without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated, gentlemen, in the race of life. But he said, Garvey said, without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life, but with confidence, with confidence, with confidence, you have won even before you have started. Garvey was once asked, are you an African or are you what you make? Are you an African or are you what you make? Are you an African or are you what you make? And Mr. Garvey stood up and said, you asked me, am I African or am I Jamaican? I say to you that I would never, ever, ever give up a continent for an island. I am an African. Thank you, brothers.